Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editorial Director of Low Power High Performance Engineering. I'm here with Chi Wang from Cadence. So Chi, we've heard lots and lots about all the power formats that are out there. They seem to be coming together more than, than they were in the past. Where are we now? This has been a major headache for a lot of companies that are working with uh, verif verifying low power designs. That's a great question. And if you look at um, uh, the whole power format kind of history, looking back four or five years, we do come from a long way. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, proprietary format for some major design companies. And right now what we end up is uh, we have two major open format. One is CPF, one is uh, UPF. Actually, the full name of UPF is called IEEE 1801. Uh, even though we have two format, however, the methodology-wise, they're still very close uh, in terms of you have a side file to describe your power intent, and that power intent can be used from RTL to GDS2. Uh, that methodology is very important. That is uh, a kind of a, uh, a breakthrough in the um, uh, design methodology, and the good thing is both formats are sharing a lot of common uh, characteristic. And what we have seen right now is that there's a industry push to get to a convergence. Uh, the so-called methodology convergence is happening right now. Uh, for example, SI2 contribute CPF to the IEEE 18.1 working group, and both uh, Cadence and SI2 on the 1801 working group. Um, SI2, uh, for the people who are not very familiar, is the only uh, standard body of common power format, which is CPF. Uh, they have published uh, the first version in 2007, and then version 1.1 .1 in 2009 and 2.0 in 2012. Will power formats be enough though going forward or, or are we now even almost past that and, and need to move on to something else? That's another great question. Power format to me is a vehicle from point A to point B. It is not the actual goal. It enables a flow and methodology but it does not actually, for example, provide power savings. The power savings come from your circuit design technique, from your true innovation to do more aggressive power savings, or be able to handle multiple multi-corner to squeeze every uh, last microwatt, miniwatt, picowatt from your circuit designs. So in a summary that power format is a necessary to enable the automation of advanced design technique. However, uh, it is not the uh, full picture you still need to spend a lot of effort in circuit in, in adopting new design technique, advanced low power design technique, for example, aggressive clock tree designs, um, double edge flip, trigger flip flop, those require new IPs. A lot of new techniques are around to help you further reduce the power. Uh, so that is the, I believe, the next thing that EDA need to focus on. Have we exhausted the easy stuff at this point or is there still a lot of easy stuff that hasn't even been deployed? Well, that's an um, interesting question because the easy is a relative measure. If you talk five years ago, power shut off or power gated is a difficult task. It's not the mainstream. Uh, however, because of this uh, power format methodology, it is making the full automations very common across multi-vendors, across uh, uh, multiple uh, design companies. So relatively, the uh, power gating or power shutoff is easy right now. So come back to your question is, I, I believe there's still a lot of uh, power has been wasted in the whole design chain from the IP, from the tool, from the uh, circuit design side. We still have a lot of uh, room to, uh, to go to further reduce the power consumption. How about new techniques like um near threshold computing, which we've been hearing a little bit about, but hasn't really taken off yet. Oh yeah, so there's always, this is um, there's a, like a chicken egg problem. There's a two, new technique, but without the tool and methodology support, it's very hard to become mainstream. Uh, and it's all, to me, it's like economics, supply, demand. Uh, if we have exhausted all the current approaches for power consumption, you want to squeeze further, 
people have to look more extreme technique. Uh, I would say this substrate computation probably uh, fall into that category that at some point people have to uh, pick it up because there are no other ways uh, can be explored. And for that one, they need additional tool support in terms of, especially in the sign of analysis, you really need to deal with uh, extreme corners, you know, multiple corners, variations, extractions, uh, and IP designs, and all those things need to put together uh, to enable this methodology. Do the tools that exist today really effectively deal with uh, things like power and heat and, and many other physical effects, or does that still have to be added into some of the flows? Actually, uh, the fact that, for example, yesterday, uh, TSMC, uh, in the uh, open uh, uh, integration platform, uh, they announced the reference flow for 20 nanometer, they're working on uh, for 40 nanometer, and also a reference flow for uh, uh, 3D uh, and 2.5D um, uh, uh, ICs, is an indication that industry is moving faster to provide uh, tool support. Uh, is for example, in the 3DIC, one of the key areas is to do the power analysis, uh, density, uh, reliability analysis uh, across, uh, across dyes. This was a traditionally a packaging problem, now it's become a chip problem. So in a sense that you have uh, you know, a lot of research work now become production to enable uh, those new technologies, um, I, I would say, you, you asked me if it's enough, and it's never enough, but I think it enables people can do uh, work to, uh, to tape out chips for like 3D IC or 20 nanometer. Are we getting to the point where we're confident enough when the chip comes out the door that it actually will work and will work effectively, or is that still an issue because we're, we have so much complication in chips right now that, mm -hmm. and so, so much in the design that just to be able to say, okay, we've got enough coverage in multiple different aspects is very difficult to, to do even without thinking about power. Um, I think it is still more work to be done. Uh, what happens if you look at the, what happens right now is that uh, human beings try to divide and conquer. We kind of uh, diverse. Uh, uh, divide a very tough problem, like uh, the single question is, is my chip working or not? Divide it into different uh, sub-problems, uh, system verification, uh, block verification, SOC verification, all those are good. Uh, the challenge, like you mentioned, right now, not only the IC becomes more complicated, but also the software, the firmware, the applications, so even your IC is working properly, but how it actually works uh, accurately or properly under your system software applications is still unknown. So that's why recently you see that uh, the hardware-based verification platform, for example, like a Palladium, become uh, very popular. This is not just for Cadence, but for the industry. is because that this SOC level, system level verification, hardware, ha software, co-verification, becomes a real um, kind of a, a serious problem people need to resolve or face uh, before they can declare they have a real working chip. Uh, that's, that platform so far is the only uh, platform can achieve that. One of the issues that keeps coming up over and over again is the need to control margin, and yet everybody feels like they mm -hmm. can't do that. What impact is that having on both performance and power? Oh, that would be huge. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, things you talk about, people talk about right now, a lot of power get wasted in the computation is because of uh, we leave a lot of margin to deal with this uh, process variations, uh, dealing with environment variabilities. Um, of course, one way to solve that is push the envelope, uh, reduce the margin. Uh, that is a significant methodology change because in the past 20, 15 years, we have been working under the margin kind of a concept. If we want to push the envelope to do this uh, near um, zero margin or close to fail margin kind of uh, circuit designs, there need a whole kind of methodology shift as well as new tools and new capabilities need to be developed by tools to enable that. The For a long time, we've sort of been coasting in terms of people pay attention at least 
uh, to some of the low power techniques that need to be done, but not everybody really implements them and not everybody uses them. Mm -hmm. As we go down to 20 nanometers and beyond and probably into stack die, all of that changes. Suddenly we do have to really pay serious attention to that. How much of a learning curve is there going on out in the industry right now among your customer base? Well, there's twofold. Um, the leading companies, uh, big design companies, they're always cutting edge. Uh, they always uh, develop new technique uh, uh, ahead of other uh, uh, members of, uh, of um, you know, other competitions uh, in, uh, in, his, uh, in their industry. Uh, for those um, companies, they're very aggressive to develop new technologies. Uh, they will not worry too much about tool support. However, they still need to develop uh, a flow using existing tool to enable that methodology. There's another camp that uh, smaller companies, what they care most is cost and time to market. Uh, they will rely on the EDA vendors to develop tool flows to enable those methodologies and uh, new design technique. So for example, uh, the, 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 the power gating or power shut off, it was a, uh, a technique five years ago only be used by uh, major design houses, uh, design companies. However, now it's just starting to get into the mainstream. Uh, similar technologies will happen for the next uh, five or 10 years where uh, nowadays advanced technique will become a mainstream technique once the EDA tool flows becomes available. Uh, As we move into stack die, do we still have that spread about the most advanced users still developing their own techniques and people still following? Because not everybody's going to be worried about the power issues and uh, thermal issues and uh, even performance if they're dealing with subsystems that may have been developed at 180 nanometers or quarter micron versus 20 nanometers. Yeah, that's the beauty and the nature of those stack die technologies. I think the key driver behind those technologies, uh, people adopting stack die, is not because of um, how would I say that? Not because, of, uh, uh, like say, advanced node, like the twenty nanometer, forty nanometer, but it's more driven by multiple factors like a cost, like power and the performance. For example, the biggest gain, one, one actually big push for 2.5D or 3D is that you can apply a wide I.O. kind of interface uh, uh, on your chip or on your SOC. That will significantly reduce the power consumption as well as uh, sometimes even improve the performance. So in a way that uh, this technology, is, uh, stack die technology can save your cost, improve your power, improve your performance, that's a huge factor for uh, design companies to win in this very competitive market space. They don't have to worry about the advanced node design rules and uh, all the costs related retooling to go to advanced node. They can leverage what they invest right now and uh, create a very competitive product in terms of power and performance and the area to compete in their market. Chi, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.